Hey guys, welcome back to the Batar Project. This episode, we have a special guest um, all the way in the NRL bubble on the sunny coast. Uh, he's had 12 year career, if I'm correct, with a little yeah. holiday in between, yeah. which we'll touch on um, throughout the episode. But it's Melbourne Storm Winger, Sandor L. My man, thank you for coming on. How's it going? No worries, Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. You said you had the day off, so what are you, what are you going to do today? Uh, well, I had a little bit of a sleep in and then just had to run and do a few bits, get my washing done, um, have some food, but yeah, pretty cruisy, mate. Like, although it is a bubble and we're stuck in the resort, we have been now for, I think maybe four, four and a half, five weeks. But, um, at the end of the day, you're around 30 of your mates. Um, usually the sun is shining. It's probably our first two rainy days in the past six weeks, but, um, yeah, you just sort of hang out. I keep myself pretty busy as you can see here. It's, um, Half my room's turned into a bit of a warehouse, but there's always stuff to do. And I suppose uh, we've been able to progress a lot of cool stuff off the field with the boys. And um, yeah, so just staying busy, hustling, trying to enjoy a bit of the sun and uh, got footy every day to focus on. So it's not too bad. Are the boys starting to get sick of each other? Being around every, all day, every day? Nah, it's not too bad. Like boys still are able to, you know, mingle with themselves and have their free time because it's such a massive resort. And then you got the lads with the families and their own commitments and stuff. So they're not too bad. I wouldn't, yeah, I reckon we've been pretty good on that front. We haven't had too many tiffs with each other. So it's been all right. Do you have a partner still in Melbourne? No, I don't have a partner anymore. So oh, okay. uh, yeah, I'm a single man. So it's been a bit of a roller coaster year with um, Corona and, uh, you know, a bit of a life change on, on that front. But uh, yeah, so I'm up here by myself. But it's nice that um, we we're able to accommodate all the families and partners for the boys that do have because, you know, that would have been really tough. Yeah, like this time period, it really builds resi resi uh, resilience and, um, you know, character being away from families or if you have your families there as well, it's still different environments. Yeah, it does. It does. And I was only thinking about this the other day, you know, uh, the end result to most challenges in life are, are personal growth. But I think this is one of those things that we'll look back on, especially with football players, you know, although it, it's sort of mixed, mixed emotions, I think, especially from public perception, like, oh, you know, we've got it sweet. And then others are sort of reaching out saying, oh, you know, it must be tough for you boys. But at the end of the day, as you touched on, um, it does build resilience and it's character building. And not only do you get to um, grow personally, but you get to build further relationships within the team. So when it comes to that sort of stuff, I think we're just embracing the challenge. And, uh, you know, I, I do remember something at the start of the year saying, you know, this year will be a bit of a write-off and a bit of an asterisk. But I feel like, if anything, this is the one you want to win considering everything everyone's been through. Um, from a football front and personally, I feel like this is the one that the boys are really marking down and, and want to do something special considering everything we've been through. You boys are looking good too. No matter yeah. like the plays you guys lose, you just bring in other players and get the job done. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, you know, people talk about the system and uh, it's, I mean, I've never seen anything like it before. And that's not to discredit any other club, although I haven't been in another club for a long time. It's it's just different here. They've built a system off the back of a coach for the last, you know, 17 or 18 years off a core group of players. And then you come in, you adapt, you buy into what we're doing here, and then you learn the system and everyone just plays a role. So it's pretty crazy to see. Uh, as you touched on, it's, it's really impressive to see that any kid can come in and adapt and be a part of that. Um, so... They just continue to build and yeah, to be a part of a club that if they don't make the grand final, it's deemed as a failure. It's uh, pretty unique. Yeah. It's good to see when you get some games too. How many games have you played this year? I've only played a couple, but uh, yeah, that's the, that's the nature of the beast. I got injured early on, a bit of a sliding doors moment for a few other players and then uh, stuck behind two of the great wingers. Yeah. It's always been tough, but you know, the club offers me a lot more and um, I enjoy every moment of it. Um, no doubt. I'd love to, try and play some more football, but um, we'll see what's, see what's on the horizon. What's it like for you boys, like not playing each week, like and just training? Does it affect mm. you mentally? I mean, it doesn't for myself. Um, even, even at the start of the year, going, having, having a hamstring injury and putting me back for a while, it kind of set me up for the next couple of months because at the end of the day, I was just happy to be training. The last thing you want to be doing is going through all this and then being in rehab and away from the main group. So that sort of put me in good stead. And then, um, being out in and out of the squad, I sort of don't have it too bad, but yeah, mate, it is, it is tough. And there's, there is a group of guys who have had little to no game time and they're just continuing training. But I suppose you just need to draw on the things that 
do give you a bit of gratitude. At the end of the day, we're in the Sunshine Coast. We could be in Melbourne uh, doing it real tough. Um, so, yeah, the boys just come together and we try and do as many things as a team as we can. And that includes our weekly preparations for game days and things like that. So, yeah, it's been challenging, but it's just something that you can't focus on because it's, you know, literally out of our control. Yeah, it's good for you, though. Like, you got the sports cards and all that to focus on, too. So, keeps your mm, mind off it. Been- it's been massive. It's been massive, you know, especially, and I think that's, that's been a shining light for the boys who are involved, you know, Kenny, Jerome and Paps, um, all killing it. So no excuse for a bit of extra work on the side that it could be affecting their football. But I think to have something to switch off and even more so in these crazy times to have something genuinely that you're passionate about and almost, a, you know, a hobby away from uh, what you do professionally, it, uh, it, it, does, it, it does wonders for your lifestyle. It would bring all your boys closer as well. Yeah, it has. Like, you know, we're, as I said, we're all mates at this club, but when you go, when you're doing something like that, you start a business and you're hanging around each other and, you know, there's a lot of good things. We've, we've had some great success in a, in a short time period. And uh, yeah, that, you know, we'd, you, you sort of say that it's, it's brought us together as best mates. So it, it is pretty cool in, uh, in that sense. Yeah. I see you guys um, had a chat with Kyle Kuzma. How that, all that come yeah, about? Bro, far out. that was crazy. Well, um, a guy, uh, He's so one of the contacts through Jerome, Kenny, um, Foose, the boys, he's, he's with the hour group. Um, so the hour group, give you a bit of context. Last year, they bring over Kobe Bryant. Um, they did the Mumba mentality conference. So, um, through his contact, we've had some talkings with him and he's a bit of a mentor for everyone. Um, Frenchie. So he, he basically, um, let connected us with Tyson Beck also, who's an amazing graphic designer, um, who we who we collaborated with on the Jason those cards. Yeah, that looks yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was massive, man. To have a player driven, player endorsed sort of trading card that gives a creative um, and artistic design back into the hands of the player and to do something really cool, that was massive. So yeah, and then the next player is obviously Kyle Kuzma and Frenchie called us the other day and he's like, Boys, I want you to jump on the Zoom call. Like but anyway, I was I was talking about um the fact that we're also professional athletes. I know it's on a smaller scale, but then um you know, just how like that experience for us, we're just sitting there like so starstruck. It's like, oh, it's Kyle Kuzma. You know what I mean? It was it's such You guys a look so nervous. <laughs> well, it's because we didn't know what we were going into. Like if he had a set, if it was just like, oh yeah, you're just going to go and have a cruisy conversation. We've just been like, hey man, what's up? Just, just chat. But like, yeah, it was pretty funny, but so cool. And it's just like, I don't know, it puts things into perspective when, uh, you know, Four Point Collectibles is chatting to NBA players and, it's just a cool little thing and uh, it's been, it's just been so much fun. Was that the full chat that you posted up on Instagram or was that just a portion of it? Yeah, just a portion of it. I just um, took a few little bits out and then um, I'll chuck another little bit up when we're just talking about the um, the next card collaboration, which is going to drop in a couple of weeks, which would be really cool. Mm. What's their bubble like over there? Like, is it totally- Oh, well, they're staying, they're staying in like Disney World, so <laughs> in Orlando. So it's a lot different to ours, but um, he was just, he was sort of saying... They just got a massive golf course. He's just playing golf every other day. And then I suppose between training, chilling in the bubble, he's got his missus there now. So um, I think I think it's pretty cruisy. But, mate, they'd have all the proper amenities they need. If you think about some of the wealth that's in there between all the playing group, shit, it would be crazy. Yeah. It was funny watching. Like, you were the only one who spoke. I think Papi spoke, like, once. All the other boys <laughs> just sitting there, like, don't know what to say. Uh, well, yeah, I probably was hogging the microphone a little bit. But... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm usually the voice for the boys, but now there are, they were good. They were pumped to chat to him as well. Mm. So every story has a beginning. So let's go back. What was your upbringing like? Where'd you come from? Yeah. Um, so my, my, you know, my upbringing was um, tough, uh, a little bit different, but at the same time, it's hard to look back and have any, um, negative feelings towards it. Cause my mum tried to give me everything she could. She was a single mum, um, loved footy more than I did. She was my first coach, you know, at four and five, which is pretty crazy. Um, hard taskmaster, but probably drove the work ethic that I've built my life and career on now. Um, you know, I'd like to think I had a little bit of talent around different sports, but it's definitely not why I achieved anything I have today. It's purely been based on hard work. And as I said, that's been driven in from a young age, um, you know, we, I grew up in Woolloomooloo. It's probably a little bit different to how it is now. It's a little, it was a little bit rougher back then, but yeah, I guess just, I had, I had that internal self-belief. I, um, you know, grew up really young, uh, you know, 
for lack of a better term, created a lot of self-awareness, you know, that street smart common sense. Um, the best example I have, and it sort of just, it's, just gets me every time. It's quite funny. You know, in, in year one, I think I was seven years old, I would walk to Kings Cross station, catch a train and a bus just to primary school and then do that every day. So <laughs> as crazy as that seems now for me, that was kind of normal. So it's just a little bit of an insight into, you know, just grew up quick and just had, had a bit of smarts about me. And then, um, I suppose that's, that sort of set me up for life, but I always wanted to do something great. Always wanted to do something bigger. Sport was my first love i played every sport i possibly could um you know boxing uh probably rugby union soccer these were sort of my main sports and then rugby league was my genuine passion i was a big roosters fan um and ended up making that decision to focus solely on that around 14 15 ended up in a boarding school with a bit of a footy scholarship and um you know just sort of cracked on from there until um yeah just went through the roosters system uh, as I said, that was the, there's not many Roosters juniors that have made it all the way. I think there's literally like a handful with a couple of new faces, uh, Lockie Lamb and Victor Radley, but, um, yeah, just, just did what I had to do. Went through my first major adversity, having my ACL reconstruction at 17, but, um, ultimately set me up for the rest of my life, which, you know, I was 69 kilos ring and wet, just a, uh, just a skinny winger and uh, mum sent me to the gym, had the year off school, got me in a dietitian. And I came back the next year for SG ball under 18s at 83 kilos and it completely <laughs> changed the way I played. Yeah. I was just, you know, had that power game, had a lot of confidence. Um, and yeah, that's, that really set me up for my under twenties experience and then was able to debut under uh, Freddie Fittler who gave me my debut when he was coach at the Roosters in 09. And um, yeah, it sort of flowed on from there, but that's a little bit of an insight into how things got started. How many games did you play for the Roosters? I played three games for the Roosters. Um, on my debut, unfortunately, we went out at, well, not unfortunately, but went out to a nightclub and the boys got into a bit of a ruckus. I was sort of held accountable, which is unfortunate. And as you've seen, you know, the media um, can, it's, it's, you know, they used to say that any publicity is good publicity, but I think that changed around the time of when I was coming into first grade. So, you know, the media um portrayed something that unfortunately you know turned out not to be true or factual so you know just just the incident really tarnished my name it was a pretty horrible experience although i was acquitted and everything was dropped um you still never want to go through something like that and you do have to carry that tag with you for a number of years so didn't really put me in a good position with the club although i'd played first grade as a teenager i thought i would have been sweet with a contract and an opportunity but um they let me go at the end of that year and um again probably my second major adversity uh the roller coaster that i speak about that um has set me up now for the person i am it's constantly filled with adversities but for some reason it seems to be followed by my greatest moments um yep. did the preseason by myself with my mate was living out in Parramatta. um I literally just went to the gym went to the footy field a couple of times a week and trained and you know i was just thinking this is crazy like how am i not getting my manager was knocking the door down for everyone freddie actually ended up getting me a meeting with matt elliott of the panthers and um it was a pretty cool moment uh, going out there and, uh, you know, him just sort of saying, look, I'll give you an opportunity, no promises, see how you go. You know, if you can perform better than the rest of the group, then we'll give you a crack. And uh, it ended up training out in a bit of a cow paddock in Windsor for the reserve yeah. grade team. I played and, at Windsor this year. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and the training fields were even more, you know, more strange. I don't know where I was training. It was past <laughs> Windsor, but it was, a, it was a bit of a, it was a different moment, you know, going from the Roosters to doing my own thing to that. And then, um, you know, he threw me in a first grade trial and a couple of weeks in, I just went out there and did exactly what he said, tried to play better than the rest of the players. Sorry, one sec. Can you come back in half an hour? Is that all right? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, bro. After, oh, after right. the cleaners. Um, yeah. And then, mate, I just, just ripped in the first couple of games and they offered me a contract. So before you knew it, I was at a, you know, full time with Penrith and then debuted in round 17. So yeah, it's just funny how, and all, you, all I can put it down to is that there has to be something around the mentality um, that you take on when you're faced with these challenges of adversity. You know, ultimately it is emotional. It sucks. There's no, there's no doubt in that, but the reality of the situation is you need to move on as quickly as possible. You need to set yourself new goals, new tasks and create yourself a little bit of a pathway out of that situation. And, that just seems to be what I've done every time. Um, you know, looking back in hindsight, just maintain that positive attitude and positive attitude is a thing that gets thrown around now. You know what I mean? So it's not to say that you don't need to take on the emotions of any situation. I think you need to deal with that. You can't just be sweeping everything under the rug, but it's just a simple 
decision for me. When something like that happens, do I sit there and let it consume me or do I find a way out and just focus on that? So when you, when you bring it down to those two facts, it's a really simple decision. And those are decisions I've taken over and over. And in that circumstance I did, and it led to something great. Unfortunately, it was followed on by two shoulder reconstructions later that year, which is a unbelievable experience, like something that not many people go through. Um, which takes me into the next phase of my life, which is the experience around Stephen Dank. Um, but even then, if you, you know, you, you don't fast forward to the time of the suspension, double shoulder reconstruction, really tough time, you know, new coach at Penrith, don't really get to impress, you know, my body completely changed. You can imagine not doing weights for six months, yeah. um, but then being thrown a lifeline at Canberra Raiders and just that little bit of faith triggered uh, some of the best football in my life and some of the best moments in my football career. So yeah, strange how it works, but there's got to be something in it. You were killing it down at Canberra, weren't you? Yeah, mate, it was unbelievable. Like, I don't know, this. I just, I don't. If you ask any football player, I don't care how their level of success to the greats, to the guys who are you know playing minimal games. There's only a small window of time when you're playing and you're just loving it. You feel like a kid again. You know what I mean? We were just having the time of our lives. You were going out there just enjoying everything you were doing. And that reflected, you know, me and um, the Fergie Ferg, Blake Ferguson had an unbelievable relationship. Uh, I think we were able to knock off. We scored something like 30 tries in our, in our 15 games uh, in, the, in the early part. So mate, it was just, we're just having a good time. I made a run for the finals. And then, uh, you know, 2013 ended up being a bit of a hectic year, but <laughs> mm. <laughs> mate, moments like that, you look back on and uh, you sort of cherish. Yeah, because I was only a kid back then. I used to remember seeing all the highlights of you scoring all those tries. I was like, fuck, this guy's a gun. Nah, it was a good time. I wouldn't, wouldn't mind uh, turning back the clock, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about Stephen Danks and all that, because I was young, so I don't remember much. I only remember the footy show interview that you did. Yeah, well, that was a big help, to be honest. Um, but yeah, 2011, Stephen Dank was uh, brought into the club to do some different work, you know, um, around blood testing and altitude training, which is hypoxic work. Um, he'd done it at the, we knew he'd come from the Sharks. He'd done a heap of work there. He was also at another AFL club. So he was in and around the club at the time I was injured and sort of training uh, in the gym, not with the main group. And he was introduced to me by the sports science team there that he could help out. Um, you know, it's interesting now to, you know, you see, I had this conversation the other day with a dietitian, and uh, it, it's it's factual. It gives good context, but the the reality is, this: if you were to get walk into any chemist, any um, even you know even supermarkets, there are products with the word peptides on it, and it's a bit of a like crazy word, you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, it's another it's a scientific word for amino acids, amino acid profile. So at the day, someone who's quite keen on their training and nutrition, I knew exactly what that was, and it didn't really create any fear in my mind. Um, once that was explained to me, of course, then there's a couple of naive moments, which I'll get into, but of course the questions were asked like, is this sweet to do? Is it illegal? Of course, I asked all the relevant questions because there's no way that for what was perceived to be a small advantage in my recovery, that I was going to take the risk of losing my career. This, I just don't believe, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure there's some people faced with extreme circumstances that may take that, but I honestly believe that most athletes and even most athletes get in trouble they don't, they don't want to take that path. You know what I mean? I don't, I really don't think that's something they're willing to risk. Um, so went through that process. Now the, the sort of naive moment looking back in hindsight was, Oh, you know, we will we'll probably, we probably don't want to um, go through our club doctor. He's probably going to be a little bit reserved. You know, there is some, there is an element of truth to that. If I'm yeah. honest, um, you know, m may not want to take on something that, um, that's not, that's outside the norm. So I was like, okay. And then ended up going to a le fully legitimate doctor, um, at a clinic, you know, in front of people, there was nothing to hide and the, the bills ultimately were paid for by the club. So when you look at that all in context, uh, the fact that I, and this is on record that I checked it with the Asada website, you know, those are, there's some pretty significant details, you know what I mean? So, um, and if I ever thought that I was doing something wrong or it was a banned substance, which it wasn't, um, you know, then the, the numerous amount of tests I would get over that period in the next year or two years would have confirmed it, but it didn't. So um, that's basically in a nutshell, that went on for a couple of months. I don't know if, if I got a huge gain out of it or not, but um, ultimately in 2013, a week before, it was the last trial, a week before the first game, I was sitting there watching the news and it was like, bang, darkest day in Australian sports, Stephen Day. I was like, what the, like, holy yeah. shit, what is this? Like, I... 
like, I know him. Like, what do you mean? And then I called my manager straight away and I was like, man, this is what happened. Like, what's the go here? And then, yeah, it was just a spiral out of control. You know, at first it was like, who's involved, who's involved? No one knew. I knew internally I had to just speak to my manager and my mom couldn't really communicate with anyone. So already taking quite a huge toll on my life. Um, and then it would slowly be drip fed. These teams are involved. These players are involved. It's Sandor Earl. And then it was like, so it was a long year. That whole year was far harder than having to experience, you know, ultimately the end decision, which was like, yeah, look, I'm, I'm willing to cooperate. It, it is what it is. Uh, I just want it to end. And all the public scrutiny, that was way easier than having to try and play football, rock up every day. Um, you know, your personality takes a hit, your relationships take a hit. You're like, you're sort of not yourself. Um, you're trying to play professionally as well with all that cloud over your head and the scrutiny. So that was really hard. And then, you know, at the end of the day, when it all, when it all came to fruition, it's, it's still a hard pill to swallow. Four years is a long time, especially around that time. I never thought that would happen, but um, given a few minor details and the way it all came about through text messages, it's all, it's all quite unique. So I don't hold much angst towards the situation. It was, they, they have, they deal in sort of black and white methods and um, it had never been seen before, but yeah, it was something that I would have liked to avoided. But um, as I always say, that time period, I did so much, saw so much, changed me as a person. I grew so much as a person. I experienced the world. You know, I spoke to people I would never have spoken to, um, got involved in business and it would re it would be really hard to take back those uh, four years because they've you know, shaped me to be the person I am today. Mm. How do you get banned when the substance wasn't a banned substance? Um, there's, yeah, there's a bit of a gray area there, but apparent, but you know, apparently it, although it wasn't on the banned list, it's still seen to, um, promote growth, growth hormone, um, production. So yeah, it's still something I don't totally understand, but apparently the power, they have the power to do that. Mm. And you didn't get busted for a drug test. It was for your text messages and that, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 It's Bro, pretty weird. That's shit. And then. The media portrayed you as a trafficker, I think. Yeah, which is, you know, the really, really shit thing. Like, not only does the meaning of the word completely not correlate with the definition that I was being suspended for, which is crazy, but, um, yeah, I just I, I always thought that was ridiculous. And it, yeah. it still is to this day. And I've had conversations with the powers that be with the tribunal that I tried to fight it with, which is independent um, with some high up people who've agreed that that should have been overturned. And then also I've had talkings with Asada and you know, they're probably not amazed with the end result and some of the definitions around that, but it's all in hindsight. It is what it is. And um, it's just going to be one of those crazy things that I have to look back on. And as I said, it's not, it's a hard pill to swallow, but what can you do? <laughs> yeah, it kind of tarnishes your name as well. Like the media just love to twist stuff like trafficking. Yeah, that, that's, you know, high drug pins, cocaine and shit, yeah, exactly. not little peptides. Yeah. But that also, that also tarnishes the, um, I suppose the, what's the word I'm looking for? The reputation of the media and, you know, there are, I suppose, you know, when they're trying to portray different things that I, I, I don't think the media has the best name for those sort of things. But at the end of the day, people make their public perception off like what's going on and what they hear and see, which I understand. So that's why things like that channel nine interview that I was able to do a couple of months later really humanized the whole thing. And it was like, Oh wow. Okay. Well, hang on. This is a little bit different and actually hearing someone speak rather than um, going off the headlines, you know what I mean? So um, as I said, really unfortunate that whole part of it because i do believe that that was that that was pretty wrong in at the at the end of the day but um yeah you come out of it and once people got the details public perception did a full 180 and uh, everyone understands it and uh you know by the time i was come back it was almost a you know rooting for the underdog moment and everyone just wanted to see me come out of that and do well so that was really nice obviously it was hard at the time but um yeah that's just how it goes i seen you tried this time of a french rugby club yeah. So that was, a, that was a funny one. Like I've always been um, quite outward thinking, you know, like I, I love business. I love doing all these different little hustles, quite entrepreneurial, but even with rugby league, I was like, you know, I want to travel the world. How cool would it be to play rugby? Probably wouldn't have done it then, but I've all, always had those sort of thoughts, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, when it all happened, I kind of was just kind of was just scared about the whole thing. And I was like, oh, I'm getting out of here. Like, you know, I don't want to, 
I'm over it. Like didn't know what the end outcome was and kind of thought like, oh, I haven't done anything wrong. So I was like, yeah, whatever, I'm out of here. So linked up with a rugby manager, someone I knew who's now a close friend and um, ended up signing a French rugby deal with Section Palisade who are in the um, top 14. So mate, it was pretty sick. Like the deal was pretty mad. Um, I was going to be going over there. They, they look after you real well. So man, that would have been pretty crazy. It was, again, something... Like it probably wouldn't have timed out that way, but geez, it would have been a cool experience and something something else that I missed out on. But uh, yeah, pretty random, pretty random story in the whole thing. Is that something you would like to do in the future when your time's up in Melbourne? Uh, not sure. Like um, it's, yeah, I mean, given, given the context of everything at the moment, life's pretty tough, but I feel like um, at the time, it just, I guess it would just depend on what sort of football opportunities I'm getting leading out of Melbourne. Because at the time, you know, red hot, obviously you build a contract basically off highlights. So you can imagine the highlight reel I was sending over. So um, <laughs> I'd have to try and, I'd have to try and match something like that. So we'll see how we go. Are you contracted for next year or is this your last year? Yeah, I'm not contracted for next year. So this is my, I'm off contract this year and, um, obviously just weighing things up, but my priority is to just stay with Melbourne. I can't really, I don't, I don't, I don't really see myself moving away from Melbourne, um, let alone to another NRL club. I mean, you just got to, at the position I'm in and age and everything that's going on, you just, you kind of take everything into account, not more so than just football where, you know, five years ago, I would have moved here, there and everywhere just to play footy. But yeah, now I think you have to take everything, even if there was to be, you know, some different opportunities at other clubs. I think um, that's sort of where I'm focused on right now. Yeah. So if Melbourne don't re-sign you, you most likely retire. Oh, it could be an option. Like that's a, it's a weird thought because I feel like I've got, um, a lot left to give and it's just been, you know, even given the fact that the first year I was here, I did my ACL, which is mm. mental, but, um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a weird one and obviously stuck behind, you know, two of the arguably best wingers in the game. Um, you know, it's been a weird one for opportunity and progression, although I've taken so much and learned so much as a footy player, just not being able to put that into practice. So it's been a weird one. So I do feel like, um, I've got some unfinished business. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm confident I'd, I'll be able to, um, you know, get something done but otherwise i'm i'm not uh, it's not daunting to me the other side of life because i'm pretty excited about it but i think given given where we're at um you can't even you can't really leave the country or your state so <laughs> yeah it's, it's a, especially it's a this year it'd be tough for you like there's no reserve grades so yeah you can't play yeah, yeah that's the thing man it's it sucks like because that's that's something where if you look at it, like even at the basics like at least you can go and apply your trade you know all the things mm. we work on all the things you and then Obviously, you can really stake a claim for, um, you know, whether that's whether that's a contract or trying to get some more first grade time. So not to have that has been very strange. Hmm. So when you got banned, you headed over to Thailand. Why there? Uh, mate, I've been there before on a bit of a training holiday. So it's like a whole training holiday destination. It's a really cool spot. Um, and yeah, just like-minded people who are training, eating healthy. You're five minutes away from the beach and, uh, you know, you're cruising around in a scooter. It's sunny every day. So it was a really cool place. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to go back there because no one gives a shit about rugby league and or what's going on in the news in Australia. And I just, I just liked it. I knew I could get away there and just focus on some things that keep the mind healthy, which is training, good food, good people. Um, so yeah, went over there and, um, it was probably the best thing I could have done, you know, being out of sight, out of mind and just focusing on myself and just having a good time. Uh, and then came back from that interview when I come back home and I was sort of just there and there was a space out the, out the front of my hotel. And as I said, I'd always had that sort of mindset to try and crack onto something else. And um, yeah, there was another guy staying there who, um, you know, was also living there long term. And then I was like, man, I've got this idea for a cafe and, before you knew it, two months later, we had this cafe open and I was working in there 12 hours a day, making smoothies, chatting to customers, all the rest of it. And it ended up, ended up booming. And then I was involved in another big gym there, Unit 27, opened up a gym across the road, Primal Fitness, and then had a cafe at the end there um, called The Shack. So I ended up doing a lot there in three years. I stayed really busy, traveled a lot, had an unbelievable time um, and was able to do, have some success and then move those businesses on. And that set me up to um, take on the business I have now in Melbourne, which is the F45 gym and give me a pathway to uh, get back to Australia. Sounds like you're living the life over there. Yeah, I was, mate. It was bloody good. Like, yeah, at the end of that, it was a, it's a much better port of travel. So I did a lot of travel, 
experienced a lot of things, very transient. So new people coming in all the time, people I'd never speak to or associate with, not because I didn't like them, but just because they weren't in my bub- my football bubble, you know? Yeah. So um, it just changed my perspective on a lot of things and yeah, just had a good time. Like I was, I was enjoying myself living on an island. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's the good thing about travel and networking with people it really opens up your mind. It does. And it's like, it's the first thing you need to prioritize um, you know, as a young adult, I think, cause as you said, it gives you a, a lot of different perspective and it's a, it's a great experience. I think it really sets you up. Especially coming from the NRL where your focus is just rugby league. Like you don't mm. branch out. So a lot of players get to the end of their career and they haven't really done much. All they've known is footy. Yeah, it's true. It's, and it's the, you know, the unfortunate reality. Um, you know, I think it, it, you, if some of the athletes which we reference to um, in different situations, like say American sports and whatnot, I think they're also very different to us in, in terms of financially being able to do different things. But yeah, football is, it is a bubble. It's very, it takes a lot of sacrifice, a lot of commitment, a lot of discipline. And um, you know, that comes with a lot of rewards, but unfortunately in terms of things like being able to travel and experience different things, that sort of takes a hit. And also, you know, October isn't the best time to travel around the world. It no. gives it's a very limited option. So, you know, one day the, the boys won't get to experience a European summer or things like this for quite some time. But um, as I said, it, it, it's, uh, it's the sacrifice, but it also, it offers a lot of rewards as you know. Yeah. Well, as we mentioned in the pre-show, it's good to see like the new generation and new boys, you know, using your leverage and doing different stuff. You get to see, the person, not just the footy player, which is yeah, awesome. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And people, players need to continue to be more and more open to that. Like, uh, okay, this course is going to be that small percentage who really don't enjoy expressing themselves or being on camera or anything like that. And that's fine. But, um, you know, there's so many ways to look at it. Like every player does have a personal brand and they need to take advantage of that and use that leverage. But also like people just genuinely want insight, like what's going on and, you know, what are you guys up to? And, um, you know, the fact that if you do have any interest, I say this to the boys all the time, and this is a pretty hot topic within rugby league, like the fact that, oh, you'll finish your career, you have nothing. Um, But at the end of the day, like some of the skills or some of the attributes that professional athletes hold, you know, incredible work ethic. Um, They're, you know, they're loyal, they're, they're, they can be trusted. They um, take great pride in their work. They're great with a routine and a schedule and discipline and commitment. And, you know, all these things are amazing skills that can be applied to any workforce that any employer would love to take on. So if you can channel that into something you're passionate about, there's no doubt that, um, you know, anyone can be successful. And, you know, most football players in reality, like I'm not super educated either. I didn't finish high school, but if you, I just find that if you genuinely are doing something you like, you seem to consume all this information. You seem to really be able to retain it. And um, yeah, you just seem to be able to make quite a go of things if it's something that you genuinely are interested in. So that would be my advice to them. But yeah, I, I, I just want to see it continue to grow and more and more boys are getting around social media and that's a huge platform for them to be able to do it. Yeah. Like I love what Kalen Ponga and Connor Watson that are doing. Like Kalen's already yeah, on the cool. box, but when, when he retires, he's going to make way more off his personal brand because he's building it. Mm. Mm, and it's important. It's important. And you can see that he, that he enjoys doing that. And it's, it, it is cool, but yeah, as long as that, as long as that pro- progression keeps continuing and um, you know, there's so many ways that can branch off, but uh, the more players take control of their own voice and their own personal brand, it'll be sick for everyone, including, you know, um, the fans. Yeah. You just got to look at the NBA. Like they're all personal brands. Like, I don't mm. even really watch the NBA, but I follow the players because I love the mm. content that they put up. 100%, 100%. And therefore and I think it grows the game too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's that's the that's the perspective that um, you know, people need to have and I guess there's just been uh there's always been a battle of like it's been a bit of a strange culture especially in rugby league like oh, you can't be doing that. So I think that's starting to etch away and then the other thing is the media have really had the full control of um you know, a player's voice or what they can and can't do. And now with social media is such a huge vehicle for you to be able to drive your own messages. I think um, we're in a good space for that to continue to get better. Yeah. I'm absolutely loving seeing the boys. Like if they play a shit game or something happens, they jump on Instagram and make a video and, you know, cut all the shit out from the media. It's awesome. That's, that's the best thing. And you know, my, my advice to any player, if they get in any sort of drama or um, something that is being heavily publicized in the media, take control of the narrative and it instantly shuts it down. So it's, it's really good. I've seen it done by a couple of players now. Mm. 
So you're living the life in Thailand. What made you want to come back to Melbourne? Just wanted to see what the, you know, the, it was football was the goal because I always wanted to come back, but I just wanted to see, you know, what goes on at the Melbourne Storm. Like every NRL player would admit they'd love to just be a part of it and see exactly what goes on down there. And I just figured if I'm ever going to have one last crack at it to see how good I could be, that's where I want to go and learn and, you know, experience the Craig Bellamy and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, just had my goals um, and mindset set on that and tried to build everything else around it. And it just so happened that I could uh, – find a unique opportunity in way of the franchise of F45 and the CBD, all territories were um, vacant. So I ended up purchasing one of them and started shifting my life towards Melbourne, moved there, built everything around it and then reached out to Craig Bellamy, uh, wrote him a letter, didn't want to go through my manager. So a little bit old school, but you know, pretty cool story. And um, yeah, met him the first time and he gave him my opportunity and he was, you know, he was, he wanted to suss me out a little bit, but the fact that was just a huge show of faith, um, you said, you know, I've spoken to the powers of B, let's do it. I'm keen. I'm good to go. And I was just like, wow, blown away. That just set me up for the rest of the year. Just ripped in training. It was bloody hard, like running the gym, um, you know, working there full time up at five. I'd get to the point where I was training twice a day and couldn't have been more prepared. And then, you know, it was unfortunate that I came back and did my ACL, but um, that's just, that's, it's just meant to be part of my story for some strange reason. <laughs> Did you do it at the beginning of preseason or at the end? Yeah, like three weeks in. Oh, fuck, spewing. I've, I've, like I'll, I'll never be, I'll never be able to replicate that moment again. Like I was in the Mickey Mouse shape. Like it was ridiculous. I'd built, I'd trained a whole year to get to that moment. So that's a, that's very, very. It stings a little thinking about it because it was like, oh, what an opportunity taken away. That's the thing with your um, knee reconstructions you know i was talking to one of the boys here the other day marion seven he's just done he's the poor fella he's um, in recovery now but you know you don't think about the pain you don't think about the surgery and all the rest of it. it's like where what does this do where i'm at like what's the opportunities i've missed out on what you know so those are the things that consume your mind so it's 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 bloody tough but um as i said you know all things pass and i'm here now you worked hard too you're working with christian woodford he, he's yeah, awesome. it was really good. yeah he's a good fella he's uh you know, he's a million miles an hour, but I'm um, very passionate about what he does. And as I said, hours and hours and hours of training that was put in um, all for one moment and sort of robbed of that opportunity. As I said, it's bloody, uh, you know, hard to look back on, but yeah, very, very cool. You know, still, still, still a great experience, you know, that whole, that whole year. It's um, you, you can take something out of everything regardless of the outcome. Yeah. I watched all those return videos and I mm. used to screenshot your program and try and do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. He's uh, he's big on programming, so everything was, um, you know, everything had a reason. Everything was planned out, and uh, from you know the training cycles to rest periods to the different sorts of training. So yeah, we ended up doing some crazy shit. I got super strong by the end of it, but um, yeah, it was it was really cool. It was it was nice to have someone who uh, showed so much genuine care in what you were trying to achieve. Yeah, he's a great bloke, and he's gone through some shit, but. His business mm. is awesome and his passion yeah. is even better. That's life. You know, you gotta be, you gotta be real. You gotta be vulnerable if you really want people to sort of come on the journey with you, I think. Yeah. He's a crazy motherfucker as well. Yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like meeting Bellamy for the first time? Were you yeah, nervous? Was crazy. Yeah, I was, I was obviously, um, he's just got this aura about him, you know, now he's like, he's just my mate. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty weird, but I still sit there and think, shit, I'm in a room with Craig Bell. It'll probably, I'll probably have another moment where we're in the finals and you're just like, wow. But yeah, for years I had that pinch myself where I was just sitting in the room and it's like Craig Bellamy's talking to you about football. So it's crazy. But as I said, like he's, he's now at the point where he's just got this aura about him and when he speaks, he commands attention. So, um, you know, he's, he's, I think he's a lot more down to earth than he was once upon a time. Well, that's what the older boys tell me anyway. He's, he's very, he's tipping the balance on how much times he has a joke now and um, how serious he is. But at the end of the day, he demands a very, very high standard, meet the standard, work hard, um, be a good person and you'll always be all right by Craig. Yeah. It's such a strong culture down at Melbourne. Unbelievable. I've heard the preseason is tough too. You have a, um, all the newbies have to do a preseason camp. Yeah. That was one of the hardest things ever. Like they obviously do the, I don't quit camp, which is um, just before the Christmas break, which is massive, bit of a rite of passage. Everyone has to do it. But then the first two weeks of free season, doesn't matter who you are, um, you basically 
uh, you train at 5am, do your weights, and then you go to work, labor. So whatever it might be, I did landscaping, which was bloody torture and by myself well, with another bloke. So it was like so hard. And then you come back about three and then you have a field session at four and you do that every day, Monday to Saturday, Monday to Saturday with one day off, um, uh, for two weeks. So by the end of it, you are absolutely cooked. Shit. I guess what, that's why Melbourne is so strong. Like going through that, it makes you play so much more grateful for what you have. It does. It does. And it just gives you that little bit of perspective and you, you sort of, I think it just lays the platform for the rest of the preseason. You're like, well, I could be, you know, concrete or I could be laying turf. So yeah, I think it, it helps with your mindset when you need to get through the rest of preseason, which is also bloody hard. Mm, like you've been at other clubs. What's the main difference? Like just the culture or? Uh, yeah, the culture is huge. Um, just everything in, in, in totality, you know, the accountability is massive and that's between the playing group and the coaches, um, a willingness to learn, to always be giving 110% effort. You know, that's sort of could, could be frowned upon. It's like that old teacher's pet mentality. Like if you're trying too hard, it's like not cool, but if you're not trying hard enough, it's not cool at the storm. Um, so between that and just, uh, yeah, just constantly good people. They're just, as you touched on with the recruitment stuff, they're just constantly recruiting good people who have good values, who are, um, you know, good character. And that, that sets you up because when you, when you bring together a heap of people like that, you know, I suppose the perception is at the storm that you can teach people rugby league, but you can't teach them to be a good person. So that just creates this culture and this buy-in and a mentality that, um, sets everyone up and you know they they work hard it's it's relentless it's not about one training session being harder than any training session i've done at another club it's just relentless it's every day it's continued and it's um it's just that high standard yeah it's crazy like seeing melbourne buy these players who haven't really done much at other clubs and they're just turning mm. like superstars really down there yeah it's unbelievable you as i said you buy in and just do your job mm. like a mate of my brother's um tommy eisenhoff I, yeah, he's I, a legend yeah i played a bit of footy with him and um yeah, come down to Melbourne. He's such he's improved so much as a player. Yeah, he has. He's got he's very smart, Tommy. Um, he's always been, you know, I knew Tommy from back when I was at Penrith. He was a young fella, but um, you know, he's 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 hard and he's he's got that mong strength, but he's um he's a skillful footy player. But yeah, coming down Melbourne was perfect for him. Uh he's a hard worker, which was appreciated straight off the bat. He's a really good person. And then um, yeah, was just able to hone his skill and um, you know, he's a he's a valuable part of the squad now, Tommy. So what's it like? being around Cameron Smith and Slater when he was there. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, two very different players. Um, you know, one's cool, very cool, calm, collected. And I just don't think we'll ever see someone see and read the game like Cameron does. And I don't think people fully understand that, but you know, I, I, does he even sweat in a game? I don't know, but he's just <laughs> like, he's just seeing everything in slow-mo whereas slats hundred miles an hour. I've never seen anyone train the way he does with the attitude that he does it's uh, it's truly unbelievable like you know if you if you ever i don't care what sport you play if you ever wanted to model someone and you know just be able to give people a glimpse of to what the top top is it's billy slater it's just crazy so um yeah to be around them too is something that i'll never forget because um you know that's that's rugby league royalty yeah like i've idolized slater since i was young like he changed the position of fullback it's just amazing. Like he started off as a winger, wasn't he was athletic, but he wasn't, you know, the best talent. But he's mm. changed the game and he's awesome. You can tell he's been working with Papi. Like yeah. Papi's killing it. Yeah, Paps is going real well. And you know, Paps has got a heap of growth left in him, which is a scary sight. And you know, I think the likes of Slats and Craig are looking at Paps going, Well, he's he's there at this age, and Paps are pro uh Slats are probably the first to admit that he's probably got him pipped at this stage, but mm. you know, that's that's a guy who's, you know, we're very, we're, as you said, Slatsy changed the game. And I think the model of, you know, what the perfect fullback or storm player is, is really sharpened now. Whereas, you know, Slats and they all had to develop that. So yeah. it was a bit of a, but now you're just getting from day dot, you're getting coached by Billy Slater and you're amongst those high standards nonstop. So you can see a lot of that. That's just, that's just ingrained in his game, you know, couple that with pure speed and, He's a tough little fella, you know, so um, he's got all the, he's got all the right things. And, you know, the fact that there is still upside for him is crazy. So um, pretty lucky, pretty lucky to you know, be, be able to witness that. Yeah, it's crazy to see where he's going to be in like five years time. Like he's not a big boy either. He's what, 80 kilos uh, or something. Oh, he's tough. I'm bloody tiny. Like how he does what he does. But, you know, he, he, 
you know, Slatsy was small. Slatsy, Slatsy filled out to be um, pretty big. Like, I don't know if Paps puts on too much weight. He gets knocked around a bit, but I don't know. He, he, he takes it and he's, he's lightning fast, so it's all good. And he's a tough little bugger. Fucking yeah. fast too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so what's, what's, what, yeah. what's the motivation for you playing? Um, oh, just doing, doing something I love, you know what I mean? So just, yo. All right. Sorry, brother. All good, bro. <laughs> that's another player that's been killing it, man. I love watching him. He's a freak, eh? The cheese. <laughs> Is he going to get involved in your business too? He's always around you guys. Yeah, he's always a but. You know, you can only have so many business partners. But uh, we all got involved in it together at the same time, so um, that's how it sort of kicked off. But um, yeah, he's uh, I don't know, he's doing some good things. He's he's good cheese. He he sort of gets it. You know, having his having his own brand and stuff like that. But he's pretty cruisy, dude. He's cool. Mm. So we're talking about your motivation and play. Like you feel like you got so much more to give. Yeah, I do. Like um, you know, just physically, mentally, um, I just don't feel like I've being able to take advantage of, um, you know, really going on a run and, and, you know, as I said, there's so much I've learned and so much I get to implement at training that I just want to try and get some progression and try and, um, you know, see how I can take that into the NRL. So yeah, it's just really chasing that genuine opportunity, um, that, uh, spurs me on. Um, and yeah, the fact I'm, I'm still passionate and I want to play. So that's, that's really, the burn, the burning desire, you know what I mean? So that's, that's kind of enough, but yeah, at the, at the end of the day, I love what I do. It's, it's what I know. And, um, just don't feel like I've, uh, I've got some unfinished business. So I guess while that's, while that feeling's still there, there's always going to be a strong desire. Yeah. I hope to see you play more games this year. It would be good. Yeah. Thanks bro. So with your busy schedule, like, is there a certain routine you keep to, to make sure you're performing at a high level? Um, Oh, look, to be honest, mate, like, you know, we've got, we've got a pretty crazy schedule to be honest. And I, I really do embrace the chaos now, whether that's uh, a positive thing or a negative thing, I don't know. My life is, seems to be quite stressful in that regard, but I'm always just on the move, always, always hustling. I don't really have too much downtime in that respect. So I guess it's just, you just got to look at things for the, what they are. You know, once upon a time, I was a young footy player who, you know, trained, went to cafes, watched movies and did, you know, did stuff all. So now I sp- spend my time on projects and getting things done. And, you know, I'd like to be better at routining and scheduling and stuff like that. But uh, for myself, yeah, it's just really having a, having a want and willingness to try and get things done. And, you know, I've, I've always, uh, the, the key for me is in my preparation. I'm just always trying to prepare myself to uh, be at my best, whether that's physically for the rugby league side of things, which is ultimately my career and then um, just working as much as I can with the downtime that I have to get things done. So there's, there's no stalling. There's no, there's no thinking about things. I'm just, just really focusing on the action. So I think for myself, if I just have that mentality of um, always trying to hustle, build connections and relationships, get things done, whether that's a to-do list or not, um, then that puts me in pretty good stead and just being prepared, whether that's around my nutrition or my physical preparation, just preparing myself uh, to give myself the best opportunity. So just trying to bring those things into my life with consistency. And uh, that sets me up pretty well. What's your nutrition look like? I've seen a few players go vegan or there's carnivore. What are you? Yeah, I'm on the carnivore diet. I've been on that for a month. So it's, it's a weird time to start it. I won't lie because it's where you're in the season. So, <laughs> but um, first couple of weeks was tough, but yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I've always been, quite intrigued by different nutrition and training things. So um, I'm giving this a go with the guidance of uh, his name is Dominic Rapson from origin nutrition's. He, you know, looks after a few of the other boys who um, are doing it. And it's been, it's sort of out in the public, like Curtis Siren and Sonny Bill, Quake Cooper, guys like that. So um, I do like it. Uh, it's a good little reset. So you take away a lot away from it. So we'll see when I come out of this sort of eight week period, what I want to do, but um yeah, so far so good. I'm I'm enjoying it, and it's uh it's different. It's got a, the ideology is quite strong. So we'll see we'll see what effects it has, and then you know if I, if I do really like it and notice some certain things, I'll be able to give that information to people. Did you get the idea to do it from Isaac or Quay Cooper? What's so, that, bro? Did you get the idea to do carnivore through ice or? Uh, no, no, no. I I've I've heard about it for a little while, and I, you know probably first heard about it through Joe Rogan, and then. 
Um, I heard about Dom a while ago from Origins Nutrition, but didn't give it too much thought. And then I was just sort of like, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. So got myself a little barbecue, I put on the veranda and just cook everything up. But yeah, it's been pretty cool. But yeah, there's a lot of different performance things that I'm very intrigued by. Um, especially a lot of the stuff around inflammation and things like that. So I just thought oh, I'll give it a go and see what happens. But I've, I've gone all in. It's quite, it's quite in depth. Um, the route I've taken. Yeah. So let's talk sports cars. How, how'd you get into it? Yeah, just, um, you know, again, that's, that was sort of uh, ice Gary V influence that I've seen in the sports card. And for me, it was more from an investment perspective. I was like, Oh, this is pretty cool. Like um, the flipping mentality, had never really intrigued me because it was like the things that were being spoken about. I was like, oh, I'm not really too keen on that, but then sort of got immersed and I was like, far out, this is pretty cool. Like instantly liked it, got into a couple of breaks and I was like, there's a bit of a, a thrill around it. And then um, yeah, again, with the undertone that, you know, could potentially make some money in, on this. And then just the connection with a sport that I liked, just bang, it just kicked right off. And I think we were sort of, um, immersed in that explosion, which was Corona and gave people a lot of downtime to focus on little things like this. And yeah, before you knew it, the boys had been, um, had caught onto it, you know, Paps, Jerome, Kenny, and they were loving it. And then I guess we were sort of, we we're almost having a huge influence on other people's businesses, uh, particularly yeah. through breaking, um, sort of building them up. And we were just like, you know, I, I had had experience with business before, sort of said to the boys, boys, we should, we should do our own thing. Eh? Like we should start our own business. And they were like, well, you know, they were super keen. And then before you know it, boom, we'd started a company and just got the balls rolling. And then, yeah, just, you know, everything's, everything's really been off just uh, really strong content. Um, you know, having that real big focus on our content and marketing and bringing people along for the ride and just doing things right building a really good reputation on high end and you know, a good customer service, having the influence of a um, few footy players obviously always helps, but um, yeah, we just wanted to try and bring a new energy uh, appeal to a new demographic. And yeah, it's been really fun, mate. The business is killing it. Uh, we're all having a really good time and we've got some huge plans to come for the end of the year in 2021. So the big thing, the big narrative I want to push is, and I think it's really cool, especially if you're into it from an um, investment perspective, like, I really see the card game as a vehicle, as a player's stock. And I think we're really lucky to be a part of that. So, you know, if you look at the stock market model um, and a card being that stock for a certain player, you just see the huge fluctuations. A player's going well, the card's worth X amount. A player's not going too well, the card's worth X amount. So it's kind of a really cool way to look at it. And I think if, um, if we continue to drive that narrative, people, you can, you know, can bring another wave of people in who are like, Fuck. so I just think it's, and sick that yeah we have like this player stock mark model and it's driven by cards so you know it's a it's it's physically in hand so i just think it's really cool plus you know we enjoy the sports and we enjoy the the feeling uh that people get around it also mate it's uh it's it's quite unique it's quite niche but man it's been fun yeah like i got in probably around the same time as you guys through uh jamie blunt collections yeah, and I was in, in the breaks and all you guys were in the breaks fucking pulling all the big cars. I'm like, These guys fucking <laughs> rigged it, man. Uh, I know. It was a bit like that. I went on a serious run and Kenny was smashing it and then Paps got a couple of big cards. Like Kenny got that. The booklet the one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was like a 5K Zion and like it was, yeah, that just, that just really kicked things off. It was mental. Yeah, like I went hard like the first month or so, dropped like 1K into it. I got mm. all these cards now. Did Ja Morant go up in price because he got um, Rookie of the Year? Not a huge jump. Um, you know, I don't think it was as massive as everyone. That's the other thing about the card game. Like, it's 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 funny the way it's dictated. That, that's what I would like to see some change around that. Obviously, it's built off last comps, which is, you know, the last price sold on eBay and things like that. So, that kind of makes it a little bit weird. It would be nice to see some sort of... Um, uh you know structure around it but it is what it is but yeah i'm not a not a huge jump you got to be you got to be in front of mind like you got to be playing you got to be doing things that's why like tyler harrow you're seeing a big shift in him like yeah he, he's ended up being the the hot rookie of the year like the only guy that's really doing the only significant rookie in the playoffs um so it's it's pretty cool but yeah it's just so fun like i just want that model now gets me excited about any sport that the, the stock player stock model for cards. Like I'm excited about anything like UFC 
soccer like because it's like just that that whole thing about it just gets me excited i could literally do that with any sport because it's so cool to see it rise and and have like a following especially if you bank on a rookie who's like oh, you take a bit of a gamble like yeah. you know i want to try and create that same movement in nrl with cards i think it'd be sick i think people would love it yeah it'd be awesome to see the nrl cards worth some money because at the moment they're worth like nothing yeah, they, they, surprisingly, they are worth a, quite a bit on the secondary market, but it's from it's just it's a different vibe. It's a collector's market at the moment, and like I said, I think if we can maybe bring in uh, you know that that wave or that mindset of like having rookie cards that are genuine that people can be like bank on and be like, oh, like oh, let's see what this player goes on and try and stock up on that. I think that's where it needs to start. And then, as you know, um, some variants and some really cool cards incorporate some player memorabilia into the cards and stuff like that. I think we can do something pretty cool. But again, if we can bring that player stock model into the NRL, guys can really get around each player. And hey, it's like I got this card and I really like the player, but I also want to see if he kills it, then I know my card's going to be worth you know X amount, five times multiply. So let's see what happens. So I think that's the, that's the really cool angle to take and bring a new demographic in. Is that something you boys are going to try and push to grow? Yeah, definitely. Like we're involved. I mean, at the end of the day, mate, let's be honest. It's a very unique situation. You've got four professional NRL players who are interested in cards. It's very unique. So we'd be, it's, you know, they'd be mad not to create a connection there, but we love cards. We love, as I said, I'm really passionate about the theory that I just explained. Um, so yeah, we want to try and have an impact in the NRL space uh, definitely for 2021. So we think that um, creatively there's some really cool things that can be done artistically um, in terms of design and different, in, uh, you know, different initiatives with different players, but also um, trying to drive that really strong um, connection with the secondary market and uh, what cards can and can't do. Yeah. We'll quickly touch on your podcast. How did all that come about and what's Fueled yeah. by Fire mean? You by fire. It's just it was uh, they, the club approached me about doing something. I didn't want to do your standard old footy podcast, which is just chat about footy and talk to players and stuff like that. So I wanted to try and stem from something I'd been through, uh, my own personal experience, and something that I was passionate about. And you know, podcasts are, are sick. I love doing them. Uh, so initially, I just wanted to, you know, speak to athletes about their own adversities that ultimately led to their success. And uh, fueled by fire was a little play on the fact that you know, fire can be completely destructive, ruin you know, uh, ruin lives, ruin nature, you know, just it, it ultimately be destructive, but it can also create life. You know what I mean? It can, it can give you food. It can, you know, give you warmth. It can do all these other things. So it was a bit of a spin on the fact that adversity and failure can be used for two different actions. So um, being fueled by your adversities was the basis for the podcast. And yeah, just led me down a path of talking to a lot of different people, a lot of different players. I really enjoyed it. Some really cool stories in season one. Season two has taken a bit of a back seat. Initially, I was going strong, but, um, you know, that's the nature of it. I do need to get back into it. I keep saying this all the time. I need to prioritize it. But, um, yeah, this year I wanted to open it up and have more conversations. You know, I wanted to talk performance. I wanted to talk productivity. And I wanted to, um, you know, continue to share those athletes' journeys. So it's opened it up, but it's been really fun. Um, as I said, it's something that I want, I want to continue to do long time and just to continue to have more conversations and probably just open it up where I can just chat to anyone about anything that I'm interested in and try and provide more insight for people. So, um, yeah, fuel by fire, check it out. Yeah, sweet. Like, that's what I love about podcasts, being able to network and connect with people mm -hmm. from all different ways of life, really. It's awesome. It's very cool, 100%. So we'll wrap up this podcast quickly. Um, what's a piece of advice you would give to, you know, the listeners? Oh, piece of advice, many pieces of advice. Um, what's something that relates to me right now? Uh, I would say two things. So, and you know, try and apply it to two different environments. One, um, I guess it, it, it totals back to employment of any, uh, of all ranges, whether that's an athlete or whether you're just at your job, but I just feel like the more I'm submerged in the Melbourne storm experience and having my own experiences, it's just really important to maintain um, or prioritize who, who you are as a person. So I, I just find the, the people that make the biggest impact here, they're really respectful. You know, they really focus on the way they interact with people. And I just think it's so important um, you know, when you just, just little things, when you meet someone, shake the hand, look them in the eyes, have genuine interest in when you're having conversations, um, 
just be a good person. Think about others, do things for others. Um, have that sort of mentality. I just, I just, the more and more I see it and I'm immersed in it, I feel like people could really focus on that and it, it can just improve your quality of life so much, whether that's in your own personal relationships or at work. And the other thing is just have great pride in what you do. I genuinely believe that, you know, and there's nothing against any of these occupations, but if I was um, a full-time cleaner, if I was, you know, taking out the rubbish, whatever it may be, just, I would just do that to the best of my ability. And I think, um, you know, taking great pride in what you do is so important. And that ties into having a strong work ethic and all of these things, they seem so small, but if you can have great pride in what you do, um, you know, ch channel that into something you genuinely are interested in and you're a good person. And, th and that comes across strongly when you meet people, or when you have conversations or when you have interactions, I feel like that's going to set you up for anything you want to do. So I would just have those little focuses um, and, you know, do those things consistently and see how much of an impact they have on your life. Yeah. When your time's up on this earth, what would you like to be remembered for? Oh God. Something great. I feel like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Something, something great. Footy? I feel like, I feel, yeah, oh yeah. hundred percent more than footy. I feel like I'm only scratching the surface, which is, which is exciting. But, um, you know, there's so many things I want to do and let's see how big of an impact I can have. But, um, I do have this strong urge to help people, which is, which is interesting, which is something that I sort of battle with because um, you have to have quite a selfish mentality when you want to achieve so much. So I do have that in some respects, but then I just have this strong urge to help people. So I feel like somewhere along the line in my life, uh, a lot of my energy and time will be um, directed towards helping other people. So let's see where that takes me. Do you have big goals for the future? Big goals, unknown goals, but big goals, hundred yep. percent. I've there's, you know, I, I, you know, I want to continue to do something epic, but then, yeah, I don't know. But who knows where? You know, I, I feel like I could be anywhere doing anything. So um, that's that's a pretty cool uh, perspective to have. But um, where that's going to take me, God knows. <laughs> yeah, the unknown is very exciting. <laughs> it is, it is, it is. Especially if you have that mentality that you definitely want to try and achieve something. The unknown should be embraced. Mm. So, last question: What's your definition of success? Uh, my definition of success. Uh, it's a tough one because uh, it's probably something I struggle with because it's, it's open-ended. You know what I mean? For me, when do you, when do you ever truly find that point of success? But I think um, success, you know, success in a, if you break it down to something shorter term, if you're genuinely doing something that you enjoy and uh, striving to achieve small goals along that, um, I think you've I think you've pretty much nailed it. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I don't I don't I wouldn't put success as an end goal. Put it that way because for me, it's never ending. Uh, you're always trying to improve. You're always trying to be better. I can't think of too many things where you hit an end point and you go, I'm done. There's not there's nothing more here for me. So if you're doing you're genuinely something that you love and are passionate about. And each day, each week, each month, you're achieving um, and knocking off, you know, your small goals. Then uh, mate, that's that seems like the recipe to success for me. Yeah, sweet. Well, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you for coming on. Um, um, where's the best place for the listeners to find you? So you can find me. I don't even know my Instagram handle actually. Is it, <laughs> is it just uh, is it just Sandor? Ah, oh, Sandor underscore Earl. So I don't know what the go is there. Did someone steal Sandor Earl? I don't know. But um, yeah, find me on my Instagram. I do a lot of stuff around there. Four Point Collectibles, um, Instagram, the website, um, some really cool stuff. If you're interested in sports cards, check it out. Fueled by Fire, a uh, little podcast, have some great conversations. Um, and there's a great way to start on there. I have a, a podcast about sports cards. But, yeah, just follow the journey. Always trying to do cool shit. Always trying to bring as much insight into myself and the other boys as possible. And, uh, yeah, always, always appreciate any support. Sweet. Thank you for coming on. Um, I look forward to what the future holds for you. Um, hope to see you on the footy field more this year. But, yeah, have a... Thank you. Cheers, brother. Likewise, all the best. Cheers, man. Have a good one. All right, bro. See you later, bro. See you, bro.